Flynn has flipped. Donald Trump's former national security advisor, Michael Flynn, has pleaded guilty to lying to the FBI. With Flynn planning to cooperate, who will he now name in this game of political Russian roulette? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Peter Dobby. Now, the President of the United States has been dragged into the investigation looking for answers about suspected Russian meddling in last year's US election. His former national security adviser, Michael Flynn, is guilty. He's admitted it. He lied. But the main question now is how far up the political food chain will Robert Mueller's inquiry now reach? So much to talk about here. But first, as Finton Monaghan explains, this may yet be a turning point. General Michael Flynn was a very visible part of Trump's campaign for president, one of his earliest and closest advisors. His job was often to go after Hillary Clinton. Lock her up. That's right. That chant came back to haunt him on Friday. Lock him up. Lock him up. His guilty plea will make it that much harder for the White House to downplay the investigation that the FBI now admits is looking into potential collusion between Russia and the Trump campaign, which the president has called a witch hunt. Well, I think most of us believe it's not a witch hunt or a hoax and that uh, the FBI director and all others believe this is a legitimate concern. For their part, Democrats dismissed the White House assertion that Flynn was a minor figure in the administration. Hard to distance yourself from one of the most visible of your campaign surrogates and your national security advisor. After the news broke on Friday, reporters were kept out of a planned photo shoot in the Oval Office. The president, any comment on Michael Flynn being indicted, sir? The president, who seems to love to talk and tweet, stayed silent. Flynn is the fourth person close to President Trump caught up in the investigation. Now that we know he's cooperating, it seems almost a guarantee he won't be the last. Vincent Monaghan, Al Jazeera. OK, let's get an idea of who's been wrapped up in this Russia investigation so far. Now, as you can see here, furthest from Trump are his former campaign chairman, Paul Manafort, and his business associate, Rick Gates. They're suspected of acting as unregistered agents for the Ukrainian government. They deny the charges, and they are currently under indictment. Neither were formerly part of the administration. Closer to the president is George Papadopoulos, who was a foreign policy advisor. Now, he pleaded guilty. He wasn't forthcoming with the FBI over contacts that he nurtured with people who were well-connected in Russia. Now we have Mr. Flynn. He's also guilty of lying to the FBI, here in relation to the Russian ambassador, Sergei Kislyak. He was close to Trump before, during, and after the campaign. The thank you was his job as national security advisor, right in the middle of Mr. Trump's inner circle. Okay, there we are. Let's get going. Let's bring in our guests. They're all joining us from Washington today. They are Thomas Pickering, formerly the U.S. ambassador to Russia and a distinguished fellow at the Brookings Institution. Bruce Fine, a constitutional and international lawyer and formerly a U.S. associate deputy attorney general. We're also joined by Joel Rubin, president of the Washington Strategy Group and a former deputy assistant secretary of state. Welcome to you all. Can I ask you all basically the same question, Thomas Pickering first. Let's just all put our cards on the table here. In your mind, are we talking about a conversation, collusion, or something criminal? Let me say just at the beginning, all the anti-Trumpers hope that we're talking about something that is really, I think, seminal here. Uh, and they've adduced a number of reasons for that, including the questions that are unknown. Why, in fact, was this material protected so much? Why have they hung on for so long and denying it? Why are the Trump forces making it uh, as clear as they possibly can that this is an isolated instance or instant, a, a one-time event? Uh, I think it's beyond that, clearly. And here, I put a lot of faith in the way Mueller is operating. Bruce will give you, I think, a much more clear insider view of the way, in fact, that these legal questions work. But we all have been inundated in the last eight to 10 hours by the information in terms of how significant this is, how much of a hold uh, Mueller has over Flynn, and 
hopefully for everybody how much Flynn will be singing at the right time before the right sort of people to move this ahead. The second question is really the arrow pointed at Kushner and his role in it. Uh, and in many ways, that's the lead into the president and all those who would hope that the president would be gone soon see that as pr sort of the, the bright spot on the horizon. Beyond that, there are a lot of unknowns, and I'm not going to speculate on those. Understood. Bruce Fine, why do you think they hung on so long, to quote Thomas Pickering there? I think they'll be hanging on as long as they can, just like Richard Nixon did when he was under assault, because if they were uh, to have a complete sunshine, it'd probably result in more uh, criminal convictions than we can anticipate today. Uh, remember, if you have nothing to hide, you know, government in the sunshine is what gives confidence to the American people and the Congress that there's nothing askew. And they have done the opposite as being a government in the sunshine. And remember, we have not only the situation with a plea here, but it comes on the heels of uh, Mr. Trump's uh, effort to get then FBI director Mr. Comey to back away from investigating Mr. Flynn at all. And we have Mr. Trump also approaching the Congressional Oversight Committee and saying, can't you bring this to an end early? Well, what's there to be worried about if there's no collusion, there's nothing to be embarrassed about if you're trying to shut down all these uh, investigations to suggest you have something to hide? Now, I would want to add and, and strengthen what uh, Thomas said about the arrow being pointed at the president. You notice that the plea was made to uh, a violation of the law that makes it a crime to lie to the FBI, even if you're not under oath. Well, it's inconceivable to me that at some point in the investigation, Mr. Mueller is not going to ask to inquire of Mr. Trump what he knew and when did he know it. Uh, there have been instances in the past where presidents have been asked questions in criminal investigations and it doesn't even need to be under oath. And what this signal sends uh, with regard to the plea agreement, if, if you lie, even if it's not a material fact to the FBI or to an investigator, you could be prosecuted. And I think that would place Mr. Trump in a very, very awkward position. Uh, because at present, he's the one person who has not been cross-examined. He's been totally able to just speak his piece and then hide, if you will, behind his press secretary. And I think this signal uh, from the plea of Mr. Flynn indicates that there's going to be further investigation of Mr. Trump himself. Okay, Jill Rubin, I'm going to assume, because we need to shorthand, short uh, circuit through some of the debate here, I'm going to assume here you think the arrow is also pointing at Jared Kushner and therefore his pivotal relationship with, i.e., the Russians and in part the Israelis, because that was part of the story, the backstory going back to the beginning of the Trump presidency. But in your mind, what's the calculation that Robert Mueller has made here? Because the potential tariff that Flynn may have been facing has gone from something like potentially 60 years to maybe even not six months. Uh, well, Peter, uh, yes, I do agree with the, the tone of our discussion. And uh, we have a saying here in the United States where there's smoke, there's fire. And right now with uh, the Michael Flynn uh, plea deal where he accepts that he is, he's committed criminal acts and that he did those while he was about to become the American National Security Advisor, uh, he is essentially laying the first embers for that fire. And the question now is how big will it get? And uh, Mr. Mueller is, is strategic and, and clearly understands how to play this game. Uh, there were no leaks uh, at all about the, the plea deal with Flynn and how he was going to uh, admit guilt. And uh, Mueller is three steps ahead of everybody else on this investigation, including the Congress. So right now, uh, Congress is asking questions, keeping the pressure on, uh, uh, finding uh, uh, misstatements by Jared Kushner, where he seems to say that he did not have any connection to WikiLeaks and to Russia. And then there are emails from him that he forwarded about WikiLeaks to other campaign staffers. So. I think that the, the Trump team in the White House has to be very concerned because they don't really know where Mueller is going, but clearly he's laying the groundwork for uh, escalating this into a, a very much of a potentially an inferno for the White House. Thomas Pickering, uh, who is Michael Flynn? There have been rumors for a long, long time. I mean, one remembers back in 2015, he went to Moscow. It was a trip paid for, we are told. It's been reported by Russia today, the state's run Russian international English language news channel. I mean, that 2015 has, is not within the scope of what Mr. Mueller is investigating. But why is it Michael Flynn never thought to himself, this is wrong? Uh, Peter, let me just say one thing at the beginning. 
uh, because the smoke is fire point that Joel made, I think, is important. There's another saying around Washington that people always make the mistake of lying about some particular action in government. And it's the lying that gets them. It's the lying that always catches you up. It's the lying that's truly stupid. Flynn is a former U.S. military officer. I knew him first, and the only time I met him was in Kabul when he was working for David Petraeus as his intelligence chief. And he was an excellent briefer and right on the point. He later then morphed into the head uh, of the Defense Intelligence Agency where he ran afoul of the Obama administration mainly because of quite wild views on Middle East problems which they were not prepared to accept, uh, and he was fired. Uh, he then went into some kinds of private business enterprises, attached himself to the Trump campaign, got engaged, as you said, with RT in Moscow, set next to President Putin, accepted some money from the Turks, maybe from some other people, failed to put that down on his disclosure forms for his clearance, uh, lied to the FBI, otherwise a perfectly splendid person. Okay, uh, let's throw that point to Bruce Fine. I mean, just picking up on that idea that he was a bit wild. When he was in Afghanistan, when he was in the Middle East, his PR people that were army PR people, one remembers as well the report saying that they had a problem with him because he was a bit of a wild card and he would, he would fold ideas into the speeches or the briefings that he was given that his PR people didn't like. But the conversation that he had with Kisilyak, speculate for us, Bruce Fine. What was the conversation that he had? What did he want to get out of it? And at what point did he tip into illegality? Uh, I think, uh, as, as you indicated at the outset, and he's testified to, he was not acting as a lone ranger here. Uh, he was acting at the direction of higher-ups in the White House, and I think that clearly means Mr. Trump, maybe through Mr. Kushner or otherwise. Remember, Mr. Kushner is 36 years old, a complete amateur. He wouldn't do anything serious unless he got approval from the President of the United States, Mr. Trump, his father-in-law. And Mr. Uh, Mr. Flynn was uh, trying to exhort the Russians uh, to display some kind of, uh, uh, I, I would say, uh, amicability in declining to retaliate against Mr. Obama's expulsion of several uh, Russian probably spies and shutting down some of their campuses here to show that Trump had some particular relationship to uh, Mr. Putin that was helpful to the United States and showed that he really wasn't you know, a foreign policy amateur. He knew the art of the deal. So he had raised the issue with, well, you know, do you really, can you hold off on, on retaliating against what Obama has done to some of your diplomats? And then he also uh, was lobbying for the Soviet, the Russians here at the Security Council to veto a, a resolution that had been introduced by the Egyptians that was hostile to Israel because the Obama administration was going to, I think, uh, abstain. Uh, so those are the things that he lied about when he was asked uh, by the FBI whether that was the content of the conversations he had with the Russian ambassador. He said, no, I didn't discuss any sanctions whatsoever. And he discussed nothing with regard to the Security Council resolutions. And I think uh, Thomas is actually right on when he says that. It's, meant, it's not only the lying, it's the obstruction of justice, it's the cover-up that regularly has proven the downfall of presidents, uh, even though they weren't implicated in the chief crime. That was true with regard to Nixon and to some extent with Clinton as well, when they're trying to conceal facts. And that's an easier case to prove than oftentimes the original crime. So it's but the cover-up, not the crime itself example. per se. That's what we're saying, yes? That is correct. Okay. Uh, one more point to Joel Rubin. Joel, is, is Mueller here being ferociously clever? Because he's kind of legally nibbling away at the edges. Manafort, Gates, Papadopoulos. I mean, May the 4th, 2016, the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs has an email exchange with Papadopoulos. Papadopoulos responds to that positively. The Russians respond to that positively. And then Papadopoulos in an email, and this is established fact, this is not anything illegal that I'm saying sitting here in Doha. Papadopoulos then says, oh, I've got to refer that to a biggie. That biggie is Jared Kushner, yes or no? Well, I, I think what Mueller is doing is he's building the ground for a case. And he's, uh, in a sense, is, we see this in, in cases uh, going after mob bosses, where uh, they'll go after the underlings first before they go to the top and, and, and get the kingpin. And uh, what we're watching here is, is, is uh, exposure 
uh, of family members as well, which is unique. And, and it's important to mention that with Michael Flynn, uh, his son, who's very much uh, culpable in much of these efforts, was excluded from the, 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 the charges yesterday. Uh, his son was promoting here in Washington uh, what we called Pizzagate uh, back at the end of last year after the election during this tumultuous transition period of conspiracy theories about Hillary Clinton and uh, creating a foment, a, a, a violent atmosphere where someone from North Carolina in the United States drove up to Washington, D.C. with a gun and shot up a pizza parlor that was targeted by these conspiracy theories. So there's a lot going on here behind the scenes. Uh, uh, clearly, Flynn has protected his son, and clearly Mueller is putting pressure on every base connection to uh, the kingpin. Not wishing to put words into anyone's mouth during Peter, our debate, another but you... important point, Peter. Peter? Yes, carry Peter, on, Thomas, yes. there's another important point on the way Mueller, Mueller is operating very quickly. It was a wonderful sucker punch. He produced Manafort. Uh, the president got on the tube right away and said, that's it, nothing more. There's nothing else in, involved here, and there's no real stuff. And then an hour later, Papadopoulos comes forward as a new cooperator. Now he's got Flynn as a cooperator, and the White House is saying it all ends. This is it. Uh, Flynn is the man. He's the one who made all the mistakes. There's nothing there. And we now see clearly the arrow already pointing to Kushner. And so look, I think, particularly at Kushner is the next sucker punch uh, particular question that uh, I think Mueller will pull as he moves up. And, and Joel's entirely right. You start low and you work your way up, and each one looks better than the other, and each one knows more than the other. And that's how, in fact, you get to the top. Okay, this central investigation is about the Russian influence or not of your recent election. The list of people who may have been influenced and influencing is huge. I had to write it down. It's Paul Manafort, Michael Flynn, Carter Page, Jeff Sessions, Jared Kushner, Donald Jr., Rex Tillerson, Wilbur Ross, and Roger Stone. And those are just the guys... <laughs> You're sitting, there, you're sitting there smiling, Joel, but those are just the guys whose names have percolated into the international news arena. If there was influence, brackets allegedly, what was Putin trying to achieve? Because of the statements that had been made by Mr. Trump during the campaign, which were friendlier to Russia than certainly Hillary Clinton, who was viewed as the prime enemy by Mr. Putin, and he had accused her of interfering with Russian elections herself, uh, that they were hoping at least uh, to get a more favorable vote out for Mr. Trump. Uh, that seems quite clear. And even if that wasn't true, I think a secondary objective was uh, through the media here in the United States or some kind of collusion to create a situation of, of, of chaos or, or uh, conflict internally in the United States, just like the United States intelligence agencies where we have enemy states, we tried to foment domestic uh, controversy and acrimony themselves. So those were the two angles, I think, that Putin had. Uh, probably the most important one was to see if he could get Mr. Trump in the White House as opposed to Hillary Clinton, because Trump would be viewed as far more open to Russian initiatives and their concerns uh, with regard to NATO expansion and otherwise. Joel, I noticed today on Twitter that the Twitter Peter, bots, because piece. one follows them, Peter, the Twitter a, bots. Peter, just, just, a... to, it, just to hold that thought for a second for us, please, Thomas Pickering. I just want to put this point sure. to Joel Rubin. The Twitter bots today have gone very quiet, on top of which people are speculating, well, maybe the Twitter bots, i.e. the Trump administration, has been cut loose by Moscow. Do you think, and we are going into the area of speculation here, do you think Trump himself, the yes. man, today, right now, has been utterly blindsided by all this? Well, the, the Twitter bots, I'm glad that you mentioned it. The Twitter bots would always seem to surge whenever Trump had a, a dip in the polls. And I think that as the, the, the analytics are, are investigated by the Mueller team about uh, the timing of the Twitter bots and their, their invasion into our, our elections and, and the Senate Intelligence uh, Committee as well is, is going to be investigating in these areas, we'll find that there was a linkage there. Um, it's quite possible they're cutting him loose. You know, I think to add to what Bruce said, uh, it, it, the, the Russians wanted to get out and still want to get out from under American sanctions that have been placed on them as a result of their invasion of Ukraine, as well as from the Magnitsky, Magnitsky Act, which focused on human rights violations. So the Russians had a very clear goal. Put someone in power who will 
relieve us from this economic pressure. There are other angles to play as well, but in that first meeting, as it's reported, between Donald Trump Jr. and Jared Kushner and the Russian intermediary lawyer, uh, that was the discussion. Was about, it was about Magnitsky and about sanctions. So uh, the, the domestic havoc that this has created in our elections uh, and in our democratic process, the, the specter of removing sanctions, these are very clear Russian benefits. Now, interestingly, I'll, I'll finish with this. It, it, it's that the uh, Republican Congress imposed more stringent sanctions on Russia not long ago as a result of its election meddling. And they essentially forced the hand of the Trump administration to in impose those, yet the Trump administration has slow walked them nonetheless. So it's not like Trump has a lot of room to maneuver anyways in relieving sanctions from Russia here in Washington. Uh, Thomas Pickering, what do you think Mr. Trump's future might be? I mean, impeachment, yeah. impeachment itself is well, a political a... process. It's not a legal process that could be applied to any civilian like you or I. So it, it won't be a legal process. Will it be impeachment or resignation? Because it occurs to me that he, he's not surrounded by people who give him the advice that he needs to hear. He's surrounded himself with people who give him the advice that he wants to hear. And if he does have political friends, he throws them under a bus anyway. Well, the first question is whether the Russians have compromise on Mr. Uh, Trump and whether that results in some of the actions we've seen. Uh, that's a known unknown. We'll have to wait and see the steel information pointed in a direction. Some suspect that that's not true or all true. We'll wait and see. Secondly, for your question, it's both a legal and a political question. The legal issues with respect to President Nixon were severe enough to swing uh, the political uh, balance of power in the Republican Party against him. Uh, for Mr. Trump, I think there's a combination here. Will his politics uh, be so devastating to Republican chances in 2018 uh, that Republicans will swing against him because, in fact, he's losing his base? Uh, or will the legal questions that come out of where Mueller is or other things, compromise, whatever, uh, be so devastating to Mr. Trump that the Republicans in Congress who until 2018 at least hold sway there, move against him. Those are both questions that are important. Those are both questions that are not answered today, but they both bear on the, this, the question of whether he'll be impeached or resign. My sense is that he's a very proud man and very egotistical. Uh, and in some ways, as a result, moving him to resignation uh, would be something that he would have to choose in lieu of fighting an impeachment. And I can't give you a judgment on that. I don't know him personally. We'll have to wait and see. But many have said he will never resign. And some have said in the pinch, in the end, he will. It's a kind of 50-50 question now. Bruce Fine, just boil the legalities of this down if, for us. Is the calculation as far as Mueller's concerned? Yes. He must have, Mueller must have, inculpatory information. So he's thinking the equation is usually, correct me if I'm wrong here, the equation is usually I can go after two middling guys or I can take that information and go after somebody a lot further up the food chain. Yes, and the latter is, in my judgment, clearly what's happening. I was lived through Watergate from day one, and this is what we had with regard to first the burglars, and then it was to Haldeman and Ehrlichman and, and Mitchell and the high-level people, and then the last one there was Nixon, and he resigned uh, and it was pardoned before he actually was criminally indicted, which probably would have been forthcoming by Leon Jaworski. And also having lived through and worked on the impeachment from day one, the two critical factors for, in my judgment, to escape impeachment for Mr. Trump are one, he's got to keep his popularity ratings at least into the 30s. Nixon really fell in the impeachment uh, uh, sweepstakes when he was down into the 20s. Because you got to remember, you're dealing with members of Congress who are very timid, they're not courageous, they're largely spineless. So they're looking at the popular opinion polls. The second thing that Thomas referred to, if the House of Representatives flips from Republican to Democrat in 2018, then I think impeachment is going to heat up. Uh, and you will have much more vigorous congressional oversight investigations like the Watergate Committee, which by and large have been dormant because you don't have Republicans investigating Republican presidents. In Watergate, you had a Democrat Senate, that Watergate Committee investigating the president of the United States who are Republican. So if we get one House of Congress to go Democrat, I think the, that, that's probably the, the beginning of the end of the shelf life for this administration. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your contribution here today on Inside Story. The clock, as ever, has beaten us. Thank you very much. Thanks to all our guests, Ambassador Thomas thank Pickering, you. Bruce Vine, and Joel Rubin.
And thank you to you, too, for watching. You can see the program again anytime via the website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, check out our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter at AJ Inside Story or at Peter Dobby One from me, Peter Dobby, and everyone on the team here in Doha. Thanks very much for watching. We'll do it all again tomorrow. Bye-bye.